everyone. I am here to give you as short a introduction as I am capable of as someone who loves pollination to, to the idea of pollination biology or as I like to think of it, the um, sort of attraction and uh, structure function relationships between beautiful flower structures and their pollinators. Um, we're going to focus today mainly on animal pollinators, although we'll have a, a guest appearance by wind um, a little bit later on. I want you to remember that as sessile creatures, moving your sex cells around for a plant is non-trivial. So in order to get sperm from one organism to the eggs of another organism, so for outcrossing to occur, or even to move uh, sex cells between flowers on the same plant, often requires an external agent. So um, an animal or an abiotic uh, force like wind or water, um, or gravity sometimes, um, in order to get the pollen, which contains the sperm, to the ovule, which contains the egg. So there needs to be some intermediary, um, which is, if you think about it, kind of a weird state of affairs. So plants, um, flowering plants, have figured out a really complicated set of ways to do this, and there is a lot of variation in um, the attractive structures, so the petals and sepals, but also the arrangement of the um, androecium and gynoecium, so the anthers and the stigma um, vary in their abundance, their location, their um, timing, and all kinds of other things. We're not going to talk about the details of this because there's just too much. It's a huge field of study. Um, there are thousands of pollination biologists in the world who think about this stuff all the live long day. And I actually have been one of those people. And some of my best friends are among them as well. So I will try to tamp my enthusiasm down a little bit. But we're going to talk for a minute about how floral shapes, sizes, and colors relate to the pollinators that they interact with. And just know that there's some really cool experiments behind all of these um, examples. And I, we're not even scratching the surface. There's like an entire class's worth of uh, material behind the next few minutes of me going blah, blah, blah. All right, let's see what we can do. So we're going to go through just like a whole bunch of different pollinators and what kind of flowers they tend to be attracted to. And their, you know, the animal's ecology has to do with um, what they're actually uh, attracted to. So let's start with beetles. So I'm going to think about this from the plant's point of view. So beetles have been around a long time. There were beetles before there were flies and bees and ants, etc. So beetles were among the first insects. And it turns out insects um, and flowers have been co-evolving um, for uh, millions and millions of years. So beetles are drawn primarily to um, to flowers that tend to be sort of flat or bowl shaped. Um, they're usually beetle pollinated flowers are usually green or white and uh, they usually produce a lot of pollen because it turns out that the beetles like such that is um, excuse me the beetles such as the one pictured here um, actually eat a lot of the pollen. So the pollen is actually part of the attractant for these pollinators. Um, the reward for pollination, <coughs> excuse me, is the pollen itself. So the, po the plant actually has to produce extra pollen, which is highly expensive because pollen has a lot of protein. Um, so beetles are not particularly efficient pollinators, but they can be effective pollinators for plants that make a lot of pollen. So magnolia flowers are a good example. Um, there are some other good beetle pollinated plants as well. Um, a lot of actually uh, um, asters are can be beetle pollinated too. Flies are common pollinators in a lot of ecosystems. So uh, flies often uh, drink nectar, but not always. Um, so sometimes flies will visit uh, nectar bearing flowers and they'll eat that um, sweet sugary liquid. Um, sometimes flies will eat pollen too. 
But actually, what's interesting about fly pollination is that their um, flies tend to be easily tricked, and flowers are excellent mimics. Over evolutionary time, several, several, many species of plants have developed flowers that make a uh, secondary chemicals that smell attractive to flies regardless of whether they're actually offering any sort of useful reward. So adult flies typically um, are drawn to the scent of rotten meat or rotten anything, sometimes poop. Um, so there are there are flowers that smell like crap. There are flowers that smell like dead bodies. There are flowers that smell like all sorts of putrid, nasty things. And almost any flower that smells disgusting like that is a fly pollinated flower. They tend to be brown or reddish, purple, and they look like dead bodies because that's actually um, attractive to the insects that are going to be pollinating them. And I'm going to show you a video later of a fly um, pollinated flower that actually looks a lot like this one, the um, Titan Arum. So um, they tend to have these ones that specialize in like uh, in mimicry often uh, are shaped like a trap because they tend to trick the flies instead of actually rewarding them for their pollination labor. All right, butterfly flowers, on the other hand, are typically rewarding to the pollinator partners that they have. So butterflies and sometimes moths, but let's focus on butterflies right now. Um, the adult butterflies tend to have long proboscis, um, which is functions like a straw. So the adult butterflies are drinking nectar in order to um, persist. They will stick their um, proboscis into the flower and extract the nectar. Um, so they will flip from flower to flower to flower, drinking nectar and bringing pollen on their bodies along the way. So uh, flowers that butterflies are attracted to tend to be bright red or purple and have um, a lot of uh, nectar in them, maybe more nectar than, uh, yeah, I mean, because making nectar doesn't help the plant directly at all. It's actually sort of counterproductive to use your own photosynthate to make a sugar for another organism. However, because the pollination activity is so valuable, um, the plant is willing to engage in this um, sort of mutualistic behavior in uh, return for pollen being moved from one flower to the next. Um, one thing that's not uh, mentioned here about how plants interact with pollinators uh, is that sometimes the timing of opening is really interesting. So for example, a, a, a flower down here may have less nectar and a pollen up, a flower up might up here may have more nectar. So the that sort of directs the pollinators to move in a particular direction as they're working on a single plant. And that can have um, evolutionary and ecological, sorry, ecological uh, ramifications. Right, bird pollinated flowers um, are often red. It turns out that um, bird vision systems are highly attracted to the red part of the spectrum. Um, they are also very interested in nectar, um, sometimes fruits as well, but that's not as important when it comes to pollination. Um, so hummingbird pollinated flowers, for example, tend to be uh, quite um, sort of robust and strong, but also very brightly red. They tend not to have a scent because many hummingbirds lack a sense of smell, but they will have a lot of nectar, like even more nectar than a butterfly flower, for example. Um, they also tend to have long tubes that match the beak of the um, a hummingbird. And sometimes actually there's like a little uh, arms race between the pollinator and the flower, like the length of the tube and the length of the tongue of the pollinators may vary depending on um, sort of how much reward is offered versus where the pollen is located on the flower. So there's some really interesting papers about that kind of question. Bat pollinated flowers tend to be sort of white because they, because bats, we're not talking about fruit bats here, we're talking about um, uh, other kinds of bats that are actually also seeking nectar and pollen. Um, they tend to have a very strong, beautiful, sweet scent, and they tend to be flat and white, and the um, 
bees will get up in there and like mess all around inside the flower and get pollen all over their little fuzzy bodies and then they'll fly long distances from plant to plant. So these cactus flowers, for example, have, um, sometimes they're only open for a single night, but they have really big, um, beautiful white petals that um, sort of absorb a lot of light from whatever moonlight there might be. And then they emit a very strong scent that can be uh, detected for kilometers sometimes in the case of some bat pollinated flowers. So we have some awesome bat pollinated flowers in the greenhouse that open in the summertime that somehow some of them, the flowers are like as big as your head. They're really beautiful. And last but definitely not least, there are the bees. Now bees are the most common, the most diverse and the most effective pollinators on earth. There are probably thousands of species of uh, bee pollinators. Some of them are social bees like the European honeybee, which um, you've heard of and who are, you know, in some kind of crisis um, and that produce all of the honey that we eat, but also um, they produce uh, the sort of pollination activity for many, many important crops like tomatoes and um, canola and a whole bunch of other um, pollinated flowers. But there are also thousands of species of solitary native bees um, that vary from like this lovely green sweat bee to this adorable teddy bear bee. And there's a whole bunch of other ones. There's one called the cuckoo bee. There are just thousands of these different kinds of bees that are drawn to different flowers at different times of the year. So of course, if bees are around for a whole season and flowers may be only open for a week or two at a time, they will switch species um, as the season goes by. So um, yeah, there's clearly not enough time in the year to talk about all the different kinds of bee pollinated flowers, but they tend to be, um, uh, bees often will uh, have a perception outside of our own visual perception they can see in the UV range. So sometimes some of these flowers will have actually uh, patterns on them that we can't see with our eyes, but the bee eyes are able to perceive um, sort of uh, guides that will show the bee where the reward is. So some bees are collecting nectar and others are collecting pollen. Some of them have these absolutely adorable um, like little pockets in their legs that they sh will shove the pollen into to feed the, um, in a colonial bees, they'll feed the nymphs. Um, and it's, yeah, the bee biology is outstandingly cool and interesting and complicated. We can't get into it very much. Um, actually, one of our members, um, Anna Stelic, is an expert in honeybees. And so maybe she would have more to add about what kinds of flowers bees are attracted to. And lastly, I'll just leave you with these lovely pictures. What do you think pollinates these? So these are tree flowers. Um, this is maple here. And I I think this is uh, hickory, possibly ash. I don't remember what these are actually. I should, but I don't remember. Um, these look like hazelnuts. Um, yeah, so look at them. What do you think pollinates them? These are really interesting flowers because these lack anthers and petals. They have little sepals, and then they have these really cool stigmatic surfaces that are big and feathery. These over here. Um, also lack petals, but they don't have stigmas. They only have a bunch of sort of dangling anthers and they're just dangling there in the wind. Yeah, you knew that, I guess, obviously it's really stupid. So a whole lot of tree uh, trees tend to be wind pollinated and they make flowers that lack petals. And sometimes they're actually uh, flowers that only have one sex instead of both sexes. And that might be to avoid self-pollination. Um, so these are female flowered plants and these are male flowered plants. Um, we, yeah, we will call these pistillate because they only have pistils. And these are staminate because they only have stamens. And these flowers are also, these are just stigmatic surfaces that are hanging out and waiting for pollen to arrive. Um, so wind pollinated plants tend to make uh, sort of nondescript flowers from the point of view of our eyes because they don't need to attract an animal with a brain or with a visual system. But but they make lots and lots and lots and lots of extra pollen that's sort of out there and without uh, petals to get in the way um, of the pollen moving around. And if you're around at this time of the year when the flowers are, when the trees are flowering and you have any kind of allergies, you're very well aware of tree pollen and when it's in the habitat. 
All right, so I'm gonna go past this because um, I don't wanna go through all of this, uh, but this is a nice table about pollinator syndromes and what kinds of uh, um, flowers are available to different kinds of pollinators. This also includes moths and um, other kinds of birds and blah, blah, blah. So this is, a, this is sort of a summary of what we've done and some pictures. Um, there's a lot more interesting things to think about, but I want you to think about like nectar and pollen as potential rewards to pollinators. Um, and there might be other rewards as well that some species are able to offer, like uh, scented oils has been shown to be a pollen. Uh, and sometimes actually rewards are a little bit uh, sneaky. They're not actual rewards, but they're like fake rewards. And I will uh, post a link to a video with my hero, David Attenborough, talking about different kinds of pollination syndromes, um, where he talks about some of those uh, really sort of interesting uh, sort of rare systems. Okay, I want to talk very briefly about inflorescence types. So most plants, unlike a tulip, which I showed you earlier, um, most plants produce multiple flowers at one time, and they are arranged in sort of sort of idiosyncratic ways for different kinds of families or different species. Um, I won't ask you to obviously memorize all of these different types of inflorescences. The word inflorescence here just means a group of flowers sort of clustered together in the same, like on the same shoot. So each flower is its own um, terminal shoot, but you can see that a lot of inflorescences sort of have only uh, only sort of flowers arranged specifically and no more specific leaves. Some of them will have bracts. So bract is a sort of a modified leaf that is right under a particular flower. It's kind of like in the axle of the flower. Um, but not, not all uh, inflorescences have bracts. Many do, but not all. So here are just a few, like this is, a, there are a lot of orchids that are found in spikes. The umbel is very common um, as the umbel produces like a uh, sort of a flat platter of flowers that an uh, insect like a beetle can crawl all the way across um, the flowers that are all at the same sort of horizontal level. Corms are like that as well. Racemes are really useful for um, bees that like to forage at one flower at a time and the, the, they are often arranged in a spiral so the bee will sort of migrate in a spiral and sort of if you have a minute or 10 or 20 or an hour to go out and walk around and look at flowers at some point in the in your life um, i definitely recommend watching the insects and birds forage because the arrangement of flowers on the plant kind of directs the movement of the pollinators to some extent um, I'll leave that there. Here's some more inflorescence types. The compound umbels are really common in the roadsides around Indiana, for example, because they're very common in the um, Apiacea, the, um, the uh, sorry, the celery family. So they're really common, for example, in um, like wild parsnip, which I talked about in one of my videos earlier, and carrot and um, Queen Anne's lace all have these sort of complex platters of flowers and they uh they can last for weeks and they're like they look like a single flower but they actually have multiple many many flowers all at once that sort of open sequentially the other common sort of arrangement of flowers is a head and i want to draw your attention to this because for those of you who may be dissecting flowers next week one of the kinds of flowers you might find is an aster, like a dandelion, for example, or a daisy, or a mum, um, or any kind of flower that um, reminds you of a sunflower, or a daisy, or a dandelion. These are all related, they're all in the same plant family, um, so they all have an evolutionary relationship. And they have their flowers arranged in what we call a head. It looks like a single flower with a ring of brightly colored petals and then a center that you know is maybe brown or dark colored or whatever but what is actually going on is that all, if you look really really carefully like um preferably under a microscope which you may not have at home obviously um what you're seeing is actually a whole bunch sometimes hundreds of individual flowers arranged in the circle um 
sort of between these petals. And what's going on here is that some of the flowers do not have petals. They're just very small, petalless individual flowers that are called disc florets. So they're individual flowers and they might have their stigmas sticking out or they might have their anthers sticking out. Um, and they develop sort of sort of in a wave from the outside in. So the oldest, the flowers that open the soonest are on the edges, and then the ones that open last are in the center. And the flowers on the edges are the only ones with petals, and they only have a single petal. So it's a really cool, almost uh, colonial flower structure that I would definitely encourage you, the next time someone gives you daisies, thank them kindly and then once they've gone you can cut them open and start looking at the really cute little flowers on the inside i definitely recommend it all right i want to talk very briefly about variations in floral structure um mainly because i wanted to show off my picture here um this is a picture that a former student who was doing research with me um took of the species that i've studied for several years in the last uh i don't know in in, in the last five years um because this flower, this, this basically could be the same flower. What happens here is that there's a change in the timing of the sex structures and how they're pre presented um, for some species. This is really, really common. It's not, but, so most flowers have a situation where not both the male and the female parts are mature at the same time. They mature sequentially. So in the case of my flower, this is called Saponaria officinalis, also known as Bouncing Bet. Um, this is the younger flower. It's been open only a single day, and you can see it has white petals, and it has its anthers out here. And if you watched this single flower over time, it would its petals would enlarge, they would change their direction, like change how they're oriented, they would turn pink and accumulate anthocyanins, and then all, all while that is happening, the anthers would start growing, would basically uh, dissipate and uh, wilt, and the uh, stigma would start, the style starts growing out of the ovary and starts curling. Um, so the this flower turns into that flower over a few days. So that is called um, a change in timing like this is called dichogamy. You don't need to know the words, but botans have a word for everything. Um, and actually what it does is it separates the two sex functions, which prevents uh, self-pollination within a single flower on the plant. Another uh, way to prevent yourself from uh, mixing genes within your own flower is to have a big separation in space between the male parts and the female parts. So this is clarendendron, and you can see the anthers are sort of bent this way, and here's the pollen and these um, anthers here, and the um, filaments have them uh, facing one way. And then the style is growing out here from the center, and the stigma is way over here. So in this single flower, it's spatially separated the two sexes. Um, and I'll leave you to think about why these kinds of variations might be advantageous to some of the plants. And if you're interested, let me know if you want to know more about um, Saponaria, for example. I can give a quick lecture on why, why we think this might be adaptive for, at least for this species, to have such big changes in floral structure. Okay, one last thing, and then I'll get to showing you a quick video. Um, I want you to remember over the course of the last few minutes, I've talked about a few flowers that don't all contain male and female parts. When we did the dissection, I showed you a perfect um, bisexual flower that has both male parts and female parts in the same structure, in the same terminal um, shoot called a flower. But that's not always the case. There are quite a few species who have male and female flowers separated on the same plant. Um, corn plants, for example, have their male flowers at the uh, tips and their female flowers sort of in the crooks of the plant. So the ears of corn develop in the leaf axils, whereas the male flowers, the tassels, are at the top of the plant. Um, Cucumber plants also have their male and female flowers separately. That uh, condition of separating your male and female flowers on the same plant is called monesi. You don't need to memorize that, but botanists have a word for everything. 
Um, I also want to point out that there are some species that have separate male and female plants. So we have entirely um, separate plants that are either male or female. And there are a lot of different plants that do that. Trees, uh, there are quite a few tree species like maples, I think are dioecious. Um, and there are other plants as well. So dioecious is actually what humans do. Like we have single individuals that tend to make sperm and single individuals that tend to make eggs. And we, uh, it's quite rare to have individuals that make both. But um, in plant species, the norm is actually for individuals to make both eggs and sperm. Um, but there are certainly species that um, separate them. Um, actually, uh, cannabis is uh, tends to be dioecious and separate its male and female uh, parts. And the female ones tend to be more valuable um, commercially anyway. All right, so, and then I'll leave you with a fly pollinated example of a plant that has a cluster of flowers that kind of look like one flower because they're kind of clustered in a, um, it's not a head, but it's similar. Um, and it's a monoecious plant, so it has separate male and female flowers. One of the most extraordinary of these insect enticers lives here in the tropical rainforest of Sumatra. It only flowers once in a thousand days, and when the flower develops, it only lasts for three days. So very few people have seen it. But here it is. Technically, it's a whole group of flowers clustered around this, but you can be justified for regarding it as one flower. And We're going to think that, about well, then, this is the biggest flower in the world. It's multiple flowers. It's related to the but it's still awesome. but it's nine feet tall and three feet across. It's a Morphophallus titanum, the titan arum. The function of this great spike in the middle is to produce a smell. <coughs> and if you smell it, it smells very strongly of uh, bad fish. This apparently attracts insects, which come along here and go down into this great funnel to these small flowers that grow at the base. Until this film was taken, no one was sure what insects pollinated the Titan Arum. As we watched, we saw that without doubt, the job was done by tiny sweat bees. Like other Arums, the male flowers form a band at the top. Below them, the female flowers with long yellow tipped stigmas. The bees seem to find some reward on the stigmas for they crawled all over them, distributing the pollen they brought with them. But why should the Titan Arum produce the biggest bloom in the world to attract such tiny pollinators? To be effective, these bees must bring pollen from another bloom. But since the plant is rare and only flowers once in three years, the nearest may be miles away. It's not easy to spread perfume over such distances in the still humid air of the rainforest. Perhaps the best way to do so is to disperse it from the top of a towering spire, like smoke from a factory chimney. Okay. I could watch David Attenborough all day long, um, but I just wanted to close today by talking, sort of reminding you of this sort of process of pollination, which always involves the uh, transfer of pollen from the anther of a flower to the stigma of preferably another flower um, on another plant. Um, where the pollen actually germinates and grows down and releases its sperm um, in so that it can fertilize the egg inside the ovule of the um, um, of the of the um, female part of the plant. Um, all right, so I'll say more about that tomorrow, but. They're about to start mowing my lawn, so I'm going to stop. And I hope that you have an excellent day, and I will um, see you all again soon. Pollination biology is awesome. There's so much more to talk about, but we don't have time. So hopefully I'll do another class about pollination biology, and you can take that. All right, see you all later. Bye.